वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला दिस इज़ दोलिका ज्योति शर्मा फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश गुवाहाटी यूनिवर्सिटी टुडे विल डू मॉड्यूल ट्वेंटी फाइव ऑफ पेपर थर्टीन विच इज़ अ क्रिटिक ऑफ इंटरवेंशंस सो इन दिस मॉड्यूल वी विल ट्राई टू री एसेस द वेरियस इंटरवेंशंस मेड बाय द यूनाइटेड नेशंस इन द एरिया ऑफ वीमेन एंड आर्म्ड कॉन्फ्लिक्ट इन पार्टिकुलर The United Nations has taken very important initiatives to protect and assist women in conflict affected areas. Initially, women's issues in conflict affected areas did not receive much attention within the UN itself. It was only in the 4th Geneva Convention led by the ICRC that had some provisions for the protection and assistance of women affected by armed conflict. After that another such initiative was taken by CEDO in 1979 but in 1995 a broader and more explicit initiative was taken by the Beijing Declaration and Platform of Action which recognized that women and conflict were a critical area of concern the culmination of all these efforts was the adoption of the 1325 UN Security Council resolution in 2000 These were laudable efforts but loopholes still remained and women continue to be at the receiving end in most conflicts. Now let's look at the United Nations Security Council resolution number 1325. This first resolution on women, peace and security, the Security Council resolution of 1325 was unanimously adopted by the United Nations Security Council on 31st October 2000 it was the first international policy mechanism that recognized the gendered nature of war and peace this resolution marked the first time that the security council had addressed the disproportionate and specific impact of armed conflict on women and had recognized the undervalued and underutilized contributions women make to conflict prevention peacekeeping conflict resolution and peace building it also stressed the importance of women's equal and full participation as act, uh, as active agents it also stressed the importance of women's equal and full participation as active agents in peace and security the key provisions of the security council resolution 1325 were increased participation and representation of women at all levels of decision making attention to specific protection needs of women and girls in conflict gender perspective in post conflict processes gender perspective in un programming reporting and in security council missions gender perspective and training in us peace support operations the key factors responsible for the implementation of security council resolution 1325 included the security council the member states the un entities the secretary general and parties to conflict the women peace and security agenda is anchored in the principle that effective incorporation of gender perspectives and women's rights can have a meaningful and positive impact on the lives of women men girls and boys on the ground it's interlinked and mutually reinforcing aspects which are sometimes referred to as the pillars or the three p's are protection prevention and participation and these are critical in respecting human rights and dignity and in tackling the root causes of conflict to create a sustainable peace till the year 2011 women had been virtually missing in such crucial areas as peace talks and negotiations accounting for only 4% of the participants This underrepresentation was directly responsible for the skewed content of peace and peace talks as well. This underrepresentation was directly responsible for the skewed content of peace talks since women constituted a large part of those who were directly impacted by conflict. 
sexual violence in its varied manifestations, the trafficking of women and girls, and the worsening conditions for survival in already deeply patriarchal societies were issues that had to be addressed and having only men doing the negotiations naturally left much to be desired in the final agreements. The perspectives and insights of women were therefore necessary if the negotiations were to be effective and meaningful in any way. It is in this context that the resolution of the Security Council number 1325 can be seen as a breakthrough, although this breakthrough is, uh, is somewhere earlier in the past because we are talking of statistics till the year 2011. So what we can actually conclude in a way is uh, to see the UN resolution 1325 as anticipating the increased role and uh, role of women in conflict situations and as well as accelerating their participation. After the passing of the resolution, more than 50 countries over the years have integrated it into their action plans and six additional UN Security Council resolutions have helped develop the policy framework. Unfortunately, this important resolution has been subverted because of the lack of implementation and the continued near absence of women participants in the peace talks. The United Nations Security Council Resolution number 1325 has thereby faced various challenges. The unabridged bloodshed against women in the conflict-ridden region of the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, is a huge setback to the very principle of the resolution. The United Nations Organization Stabilization Mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo briefly called the MONUSCO, has been undervalued due to its failure to prevent mass rapes that occurred 20 miles from a UN base in August 2010. The resolution thus has failed in general in keeping the promise of preventing sexual violence, as for example we can see in Congo. The lack of gender sensitiveness to peacekeeping approaches is hugely due to a lack of will amongst a number of member states who do not prioritize women's participation in their agenda. The United Nations Development Fund for Women, or UNIFIM, records and reports that during the period from 2006 to 2008, of almost 17,000 projects sanctioned for 23 post-conflict countries, less than 3% focused on gender issues. This reflects the lack of will to usher in change and improvement. According to another report of UNIFEM, only 7% of the official delegations are led by women and only since 1992 have 2.4% of signatories towards peace processes have been women. The failure of the incorporation of women in peacemaking is based on gender stereotyping and this obstructs the very spirit of the resolution 1325. The biggest drawback of the resolution 1325 is the failure to create a common identity among people belonging to different countries which could have produced social and political accord on a global scale and led to an adoption of norms which have the potential to restructure dysfunctional societies. The United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 was initially considered a breakthrough that opened up opportunities for women to contribute to the peace resolutions. But the report titled, What the Women Say, Participation and UNSCR 1325, a case study assessment, published in October 2010, gives a contradictory picture of the implementation of this resolution. Some of the key findings of this report clearly state the loopholes on the governing body's part in implementing the 1325 resolution. Some of them include the fact that many governments 
UN personnel and CSOs are still unaware of or misunderstand this particular resolution. Secondly, governments and international governing bodies are not performing their job adequately with regard to the provisions in this resolution. The National Action Planning Commission is also delaying the actual action which can be done swiftly. The advocates of 1325 are also perceived as hardly putting any efforts in conveying the message that women build peace. Again, governments and international actors pay only a lip service to women's concerns but do not support them in mainstream interventions. As a result, the realization of the resolution 1325 can be seen only when the concerned authorities of the resolution find specific ways to overcome these problems. With regard to the interagency coordination to implement resolution 1325, we can see that in order to ensure collaboration and coordination throughout the United Nations system in the implementation of the Security Council resolution, the Interagency Network on Women and Gender Equality established the Interagency Task Force on Women, Peace and Security, which is chaired by the Special Advisor on Gender Issues and Advancement of Women. As of 2004, the task force includes representatives from DAW or DS, DESA, DDA, DPA, DPKO, DPI, ESCWA, ILO, OCHA, OHCHR, OHRM, OSAGI, SRSG or CAC, UNDP, UNFPA, UNHCR, UNICEF, UNIFAM and so on. Now let's go on to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, called in brief CEDO. The fundamental feminist criticism of CEDO is that it is assimilationist and constrains women to the male model framework. CEDO needs to work upon the problem of a legal agenda which requires women to claim equality with a male compatriot. This works as a roadblock and prevents the transformative changes which would let women contribute in the social and political institutions on their own terms and in agreement with their own realities. The second and equally central claim is the issue of intersectionality, according to which there can be no one expression of feminism which is indistinguishably applicable to women of different ethnicities, cultural or class identities. It has however been observed that CEDO largely treats women as a homogeneous group without acknowledging the different socio-cultural backgrounds of the women concerned. The critics of CEDO refuse to accept this homogeneous character that the convention has assigned for the women in the convention. Since the implementation of CEDO, it has become all the more clear that there are challenges in the implementation of the goal of equality for women. These challenges are largely a result of social philosophies and ideologies that do not support the concept of equality for women as incorporated in the convention. There are current displays of disagreement between traditionalist religious and cultural practices and neoliberal ethics and human rights standards. Both of these social philosophical strands pose a grave challenge to Sedor's Bill of Rights. In the year 2002, the Special Rapporteur on Religion recognized the many ways in which different religions rationalize and legitimize discrimination against women. The ideologies and the philosophies of different religions are manifested by the fundamentalists and they consider giving equal rights to women as a threat and violation of their personal laws and beliefs. 
In the name of religion, the fundamentalists readily violate the integrity and rights of women. This poses a current challenge to women's civil and political rights. The year 2015 marks the completion of 36 years of the SEDA. The objective behind the convention was to achieve egalitarian development for both men and women using global standards enshrined in the 16 articles and recommendations of the SEDA. In spite of having such a strong foundation, the document has faced a number of challenges. For example, discrimination against women still exists around the globe and only in a few signatory countries do the courts have jurisdiction in cases of violations of the convention. There are still policy makers and judges unaware of the convention as in the case of the Security Council Res Resolution 1325. Women still continue to face educational, economic, legal, cultural and religious disparities. And finally, governments and civil society stakeholders lack sufficient knowledge, capacity and expertise to implement the provisions in SEDO. All these factors in effect need to be taken into account for the full implementation and success of the convention. Now let's come to the Beijing Declaration and the Platform of Action. In June 2000, a special session of the United Nations General Assembly entitled Women 2000, Gender Equality, Development and Peace for the 21st Century was held to review the progress made in the human rights of women in the five years after the Beijing Declaration and Platform of Action. It was found that only two UN ad hoc war crime tribunals and the statute of the ICC had achieved some success. The initiatives and actions suggested in the declaration were vague and general. There was no proper strategy again to improve the data collection on the situation of women affected by armed conflict. There was no corresponding effort on this issue within the United Nations itself or other sections of the international community. In addition, the Beijing Declaration and Platform of Action did not pay much attention to assess whether the international laws which are applicable to women in armed conflict are adequate to address the need for, of women. Overall, therefore, the outcome document of the Beijing plus five review revealed a failure of the Beijing Declaration and the platform of action to move forward in addressing the issue of women and armed conflict. Although women's issues were properly mainstreamed by the Beijing Declaration and platform of action, it still faced difficulties in raising women's issues in some critical areas of concern. For, ex for instance, when NGOs tried to incorporate women's issues in the platform of action, they were told that Beijing was not the correct place for this issue to be discussed. Negotiations in the Beijing Declaration were complex and provided little practical guidance on implementation. The issues of indigenous women were also overlooked by the platform of action. So, one critique of the Beijing Declaration that can be made is that while the Beijing Declaration is tightly structured in terms of theory, that is theoretically in principle it has a tight structure and it has a definite goal, in practice it has largely failed to realize its objectives. The subgroup on women's economic rights in the Beijing Declaration had stated that the human rights section of the platform largely reflected a concern for women's individual rights rather than the collective systematic or development rights associated with women's economic concern, particularly around globalization, economic restructuring and structural adjustment. 
Similarly, there is no adequate discussion of the friendship between human rights and peace and militarism. The report of the Secretary General's review and appraisal of the implementation of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and the outcomes of the 23rd Special Session of the General Assembly, which was entitled Women 2000, Gender Equality, Development and Peace for the 21st Century, came out in March 2015. It made clear that many objectives of the Beijing Declaration still had not been achieved. The report clearly stated that the overall implementation of the Beijing Declaration has been unacceptably slow with stagnation and even regression in some contexts. Change towards gender equality has not been deep enough, nor has it been irreversible. In the section dealing with women and conflict, the report states that despite normative advances in the agenda concerning women, peace and security, the broader global context of insecurity, protracted crisis, poverty and growing inequalities, as well as such emerging threats as the rise of violent extremism, have served to limit and even derail progress in practice. Commitments to gender equality and women's human rights are currently being tested in conflict set settings characterized by mass violence, related humanitarian catastrophes, and an unprecedented scale of forced displacement. It is clear from this that all the commendable and well thought out plans for the empowerment of women and removal of all kinds of discrimination is not feasible at all times in conflict zones. This is because the role of the government in these zones is frequently minimized or at times the government itself follows coercive steps to suppress any kind of rebellion. Human rights takes a back seat in these cases and women remain the worst sufferers. The Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, for example, uh, states in a report titled UNHCR Global Trends to 2013, Wars Human Cost, which was published in 2014 in Geneva. The same report stated that by the end of 2013, 51.2 million individuals were forcibly displaced as a result of persecution, conflict and violence, the highest number in the post-Second World War era. Women and girls continue to face countless risks and challenges, both prior to and during the displacement process, as well as in the context of repatriation, local integration, or resettlement. Existing patterns of gender-based discrimination are often exacerbated in all phases of displacement and these risks and challenges may be further aggravated by the intersection of gender with other factors such as age, group and affiliation. Other factors that add to this are disability or civil and socioeconomic status. Now let's look at the International Committee of Red Cross after the Beijing Declaration. The international humanitarian laws are at the core of the International Committee of Red Cross activities. The IHL treats women under the general category of victims. However, the problem is that both the IHL and the ICRC take an all victims approach rather than a gender-based social norms in regard to women victims of war. The IHL takes a totally male perspective or rather masculine perspective in approaching humanitarian aid and protection in conflict affected areas. In societies where inequality between men and women prevail, the effect of conflict on women is not the same as men. Where women are affected by conflict in fundamentally different ways from men, a general category of rules cannot bring about a proper solution. The IHL did not give adequate importance to the biological differences of women in making provisions for the protection and assistance of women 
even sexual violence was treated only because of protecting the chastity and modesty of women. The IHL addresses the needs of women in relation to others instead of considering them as individuals. Now these perspectives have seeped into the ICRC as the driving force of the ICRC is, as I have already mentioned, the IHL. As a result, the ICRC has also ended up implementing the laws of the IHL without taking women's perspectives into account in practice, although theoretically they do seem to talk about women's experiences and women's victimization. But on the other hand, uh, the ground reality is that the effective realization of the ICRC's goals have not happened. In conclusion, if we take a look at all these measures, all these uh, resolutions and conferences and committees, uh, we can see that there have been significant breakthroughs in empowering women within the UN, eliminating discrimination against women and providing proper shelter and relief to them. However, in spite of their arduous efforts, a full realization and success is far from being achieved. There are some policy and organizational loopholes that become evident only when the plans are implemented at the grassroots levels. These serve to prevent the plans from being successful and effective. If the intentions of the planners are sincere, then these loopholes have to be plugged. More political will is required and is frequently found missing. Hence, stakeholders and peacemakers need to continue their efforts to improve the proper implementation of the conventions and address the shortcomings as they come to light. Where the question of peace and security is concerned, it is imperative that not only the requirements but also the opinions of people are taken into account. Another hurdle in the efficient carrying out of the programs is the important question of funds. Although the overall budget has grown, the funds allocated specifically for these plans are still too meager. It has been seen that the grassroots level organizations which are at the forefront of such efforts are handicapped due to the lack of adequate funds. Sufficient money and funds will only be available when the true relevance of the programs are realized and they are prioritized at the time of fund allocation. Conflicts have grown in the world today and pose a huge challenge to both communities and countries. To lose the contributions of women at this juncture would be both ill-advised and too expensive a price for the world to pay. So we can see that uh, although these measures, these uh, resolutions have been effective in theory in principle, the actual realization of them still needs to be done. And with this, we come to the end of the module. Thank you.